Dan Winters has photographed presidents, astronauts, innovators, rock stars, sports heroes, film icons, captains of industry, honeybees, Texas gangs, and the Dalai Lama. Today, like us, he's at home and he's taking a break from work on his newest photo series entitled The Wall Next to My Bookshelf to be with us. I'm Jamie Alcroft here with Danny Mann, Dina Friedman, and our host, Louise Paliger. Wheezy. Hey, Wheezy. Thank you, Jamie, and welcome, panel, and welcome, Dan. Thank you. How's everyone's hunkering and bunkering going? Super, super. I just, I, I have a special thank you to send out, by the way, to uh, Governor Kemp. Mm -hmm. I, just booked, I just booked my belated birthday weekend getaway to Atlanta for a haircut, gym workout, manicure, massage, tattoo, bowling, movie, and dinner. Thank you, Governor, for that gift. That'll and a special, a hap gift. special happy birthday to Elaine May and Queen Elizabeth. Ooh, yeah. born on the same day? Yeah, well, not the actual same day, but they have the same birth date. Well, I would like to apologize if my voice sounds a little bit hoarse because I just got in from yelling at a nurse because, you know, I'd really like to get my nails done. <laughs> uh, they look great. They, oh, yeah, that was me. There I go. That was you. I mean, have you seen my nails? Do we understand her, her, her sign? Did she run out of space? Did she mean to put of the? Because it just says land free. Yeah, oh, it's oh, free oh, land, I think. Free oh, land. I, yeah, land free. Yeah, exactly. yeah, come get land. It's free. Uh, Squatters. All right, well, we're going to, by way of full disclosure, Dan, his wife, Catherine, and their son, Dylan, are family to me and my family. Um, he, what? Yeah, I'm yeah, we have. I have evidence. I'm, They're here at, here at our wedding. Oh, my God. I can't believe it. Aww. Right? <laughs> Checkered tablecloths. There's Kath. Um, and we're going to explore Dan's very impressive website right now and get into his history and his accomplishments. Um, yes. Dan... Uh, known for the broad range of subject matter, he is able to interpret Dan Winters is widely recognized for his unusual celebrity portraiture, his scientific photography, photo illustrations, drawings, and photo journalistic stories. Winters has won over 100 national and international awards. He has had multiple solo gallery exhibitions. His books include Dan Winters America, Icons and Ingenuity, Blast Launch, Periodical Photographs, and Road to Seeing, which chronicles his path to becoming a photographer, and The Gray Ghost, which is a selection from 30 years of his New York street photography. Dan's clients include Esquire, GQ, Vanity Fair, The New York Times Magazine, The New Yorker, New York Magazine, Time, Wired, National Geographic, Smithsonian Magazine, Fortune, Variety, W, Entertainment Weekly, Rolling Stone, Newsweek, Golf, Digest, Vanity Fair. I can't even read that many magazines. Um, and many other national and international publications. That's like all the magazines that, that Sarah Palin reads right there. Exactly. Uh, there you go. Advertising clients include Apple, Netflix, Samsung, Microsoft, Nike, Target, Sony, Bose, Amazon, HBO, Saturn, Sega, Warner Brothers, NBC Universal, Paramount, DreamWorks, Columbia, TriStar, and 20th Century Fox, RCA, Atlantic Records, A&M, Sony, Warner Brothers, Electra, Introscope, and Epitaph. Dan, you come to us with with scores of stories, but can you open with the tale of how you photographed President Obama at the White House in under nine minutes? Uh, yeah, I, I, I sort of chose that because that was kind of an extreme uh, example of what we do. Um, you have eight minutes, go. You get, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I, did, I did have one person whose designated job was to call out every single minute, and then they just stood there with a timer, yeah, yeah. and they're like, you're at two, you're at three, we gotta move kind of thing. Um, I think the biggest challenge was I'd photographed him before and I was given 20 minutes in 2008 and then in 2016 um, I was given five. Which Shows is, you how people change, doesn't it? Yeah, well, totally. But um, what, what, which is typical. I mean, the, you pretty much expected the president, you get five minutes. The problem with that for me was that it wasn't a single portrait that the magazine needed. They were doing an entire issue on Obama. And so I had to generate like an entire sort of well uh, uh, of, of photographs for that. So that's very challenging. So what I did, I flew to uh, DC uh, from Austin where I live and I went to the White House and they gave me sort of what my options were. You know, the, the blue room is what I chose, which is a really large room. And that was available for me to, to use that. It's just a, just a, maybe 20 steps down from the Oval Office. And so I sc scoped that out, 
scoped out the power, et cetera, talked to security, talked to everybody. And then a couple of weeks later, we, we uh, showed up there. So we had a cube truck full of equipment. I had six assistants and we had six hours to prep prior to the shoot. Wow. Um, and so we kind of came up with a layout and there were six separate setups. Uh, so redundant tripods, redundant cameras, redundant lights. And uh, we put arrows on the floor even for him with tape so he'd know where to walk to the next setup. <laughs> and uh, and I, it seems like overkill, but really nine minutes to make six images that are compelling and that work. It's really like trying to do that. And to add to which, he doesn't really like to be photographed that much. But um, <laughs> he did, he remembered the 2008 shoot, which worked to my advantage. And um, and uh, so I felt like we were ready. He came in and we got going. And I'd done a portrait of him in 2008. I'm not sure on the website if that diptych's on there of he uh, of uh, him in 2008, him in 2016. The 2008 shot, you know, he looked so young to me and such a baby and going into this sort of great adventure. And I wanted to replicate that shot in 2016 to sort of, you know, obviously the aging uh, is called out in that image quite a bit. But I, I like the idea of like kind of bookending his tenure in office. So that was an important one for me to do. I did that first uh, and then jumped into a tight shot of his hands, moved him uh, over yeah. to a background, to a colored background, that green background. Yep, exactly. That was the next thing we shot. Probably mm -hmm. 10 frames of that, maybe 15 frames of that. Um, and of course, the nice thing about six hours of prep time with stand-ins is everything's so dialed that uh that um there's really there's i can start shooting immediately and just mm -hmm. the most mild of tweaks are required um the funny thing this is actually the funniest part of the story this um this image i really wanted this image this is the last one i shot and uh i uh you can't put a light stand on directly onto the carpet in the white house they give you these six inch by six inch squares of carpet and each leg of a light stand has to sit on the squares the tripods have to sit on the squares so there's all these carpet they brought in cases of carpet squares for us and we have these carpet squares everywhere because there were probably 30 <laughs> minimum 30 or 40 stands total uh involved in the shoot and uh, anyway so i sat my camera this is a very tricky lighting situation with the sky and the interior you know it's a very fine balance there's no lighting here it's available light so um i figured out the exposure right before he came in because we got a five minute heads up um so i i figured this exposure out and i let the camera i left the camera seat sitting on one of the little carpet squares and uh, exposure was set everything was ready so i got to that station right at the end and said you know i need you to stand here look towards the monument whatever um and then I brought the camera up and shot a frame and I looked at it and on the LCD, it was almost completely blown out, like almost white, like the exposure was completely off. And I just scrambled and I went back to my newspaper days when I could guess exposures really quickly. And I was just like, okay, this is F8 at 125th. <laughs> Which it really quick, boom, nailed it. Shot six frames of this and we we're done. It turns out what happened was my wife had called my assistant and said, make sure you take pictures of Dan while he's shooting. So he had grabbed the camera, changed the exposure for the interior of the room, and shot a bunch of pictures of me working and then sat it down and didn't, re, uh, didn't readjust the exposure. I thought that was, a, that was pretty funny. It could have been a disaster. Because when I was setting the exposure, I heard him, uh, the president said, uh, I don't hear any clicking, Dan. I don't hear any clicking. <laughs> Like, yeah, just give me, give me one second. Give me one second. And by then we'd gone to nine minutes. So he was very That's and, too funny that he's you know, back is turned to you. And then, and he, what, what was he doing magnificently looking out at the, at all he, uh, you know, surveys and, uh, and yeah. about his eight years as our commander in chief. And no, he's scolding <laughs> Dan. Yeah. Yes. I, 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 I don't hear thoughts. clicking. I don't hear clicking. <laughs> yeah. Need some clicking here. Uh, I want to hear clicking. Yeah, I photographed Bernie a uh, weekend before last, actually, and uh, for the New York Times magazine. And Bernie gave me five minutes. And he actually then said, okay, you, you, can, you can have another, you can have another minute. Because I was, he saw that I was, you know, hustling to get this. Same kind of thing, you know, multiple setups, multiple lighting setups, you know. Everything's discussed in advance. That's awesome. What, 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 do, what, what yeah. does the carpet squares accomplish? Is that just to not to mark up the permanent carpet? 
Yeah, it's just padding so yeah. that the scans don't put a dent, you know, a dent in the carpet. A dent in the carpet because it's yeah. the pile's probably three inches thick. Yeah, and my guess is as well that they use that a lot for media stuff. Right. Or, Maybe frequently. I mean, they were certainly prepared. It's really interesting. We needed a ton of power. And my big worry oftentimes going into buildings, houses, et cetera, is the power is very difficult. to power. The amount of power we need to power our strobes uh, is, is, is difficult to find. And I was worried going into that room that there wouldn't be. And there are these hidden doors that they open. And they have <laughs> huge distribution boxes. Like, they are so savvy at that place. It's not even funny. Wow. Was but Dan, can you talk for a moment about the relationship between the photographer and the subject? Does it need to be warm and trusting in order to capture a true image? And how do you cultivate that? And are you a good read of people? and personalities is that a part of the requirements of being a, a good gonna be. Gonna be. Yeah. yeah i mean i i think uh i i, I definitely feel like i'm I, I i can read people pretty well i mean i i tend to like people which is helpful if you're a portrait photographer but i actually genuinely like to be around and i'm not sort of engaging my subjects because I have a task at hand that I have to accomplish. I'm genuinely interested. Um, it's a lot easier now to learn about my subjects. Uh, back in the day, in the 80s and 90s, you know, I would literally call the writer. What's what's it like hanging out with the guy? Does he have any interest? Like the writer usually already gone and met with the person. So that was kind of my lifeline there. But now, you know, it's really easy. Like Tom Hanks, uh, he collects typewriters. He's really interested in typewriters. So that's a great, he's really interested in American history, the space program. So all of those things, you know, I feel like I can find common ground with, uh, with people pretty easily. Um, a lot of times I'll shoot people that I've shot multiple times. So it's kind of like picking up a dialogue, which is, uh, which is nice. And uh, oftentimes there's a connection somehow through uh, someone I've worked with or someone I know with the subjects like, Oh, you know, I know so-and-so they're, they said to say hi or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, you know, kind of, I suppose using all those, all those tools to kind of have an understanding of the person. But then what it comes down to ultimately is just kind of making a human connection. You know, I mean, we're all, what do we all have in common? I remember a friend of mine, I, I said, why do you think it is that people, all people talk about the weather? And he said, well, it's probably because we all have it in common. And it's totally true. Like at the bare minimum, like, I'm hot. I'm cold. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's pretty simple, but I do, I do feel like, uh, I do feel like having some sort of connection with the subject is really, really important in order to achieve kind of what the task at hand is. But oftentimes, um, this is kind of a, I don't know if it's a trade secret, but it's something that I know to be true. And that is if I have five minutes to create an image, I also know how to get the image I need. You know, I can, I direct the whole time, you know, so it's like chin down, eyes here, you know, turn your head a little bit, stop, tilt your head a little bit that way, stop. Like I know what I need to get, you know, so sometimes it unfolds very organically. And sometimes in the case of a nine minute shoot, I have to really try to control what's going on in order to get what I need, you know. I mean, the last thing a subject wants, in my opinion, is to stand there and have to generate their own, you know, position pose. You, you know, don't know what to do. Totally. It feels yeah. odd. And a lot of times actors have told me, like, being photographed, still photographs, it feels very odd to them because they don't have something to do. When they're acting in front of a the camera, they have a, you know, they have an agenda, you know. Motivation. Yeah. Totally. So, you know, I've, I've, many people have said, thank you so much for, like, taking me through that. And a couple of people like to, you know, Anthony Hopkins really likes to give you stuff. You know, he says, okay, just tell me when you're ready and I'll, I'll give you stuff, you know. Uh, Christopher Walken, same thing. Like, tell me when you're ready and I'll give you stuff. But most people are thrilled if you just walk them through the thing, you know. I just, think you may have to tell uh, your, your Mr. Rogers story. Oh, yeah. Um, which part of it? My God. I don't know, just, just the way <laughs> just the man you found when you got yeah. to Pittsburgh. <laughs> oh, he was, he was unbelievable. You know, it, the, 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 there was a film that was done this year with Tom Hanks where he pay, played Mr. Rogers, and it was about uh, the Esquire writer, Tom Junot, who got the assignment from Esquire to go down to Pittsburgh and write about Mr. Rogers. And what Tom ended up 
writing about was how Mr. Rogers changed him. It's a brilliant story. So it's less of a biopic piece on Fred Rogers, and it's more about how one man changed another man's life. And so they, they did a film of this. And the funny thing is they were actually doing the film about the shoot that I did. They even made like the magazine cover with Tom Hanks and stuff. And I shot the posters for that film. And, uh, but Fred was, the best story about Fred for me was that uh, we went to um, Chinese one night. I think it was the last night I was with him three days. We went to a Chinese restaurant that he's gone to forever. Just a really little greasy Chinese restaurant in a neighborhood in Pittsburgh. And he, um, we had dinner and at one point there was a TV over my shoulder and he kept, I noticed he kept like, like everyone does, you know, we're like, it's very difficult to not sort of like fall into sort of the glowing lantern. And uh, the waiter came over and he very gently asked the waiter if he would turn the TV off. And which I thought was interesting since he made his life, his career on television. But um, at the end of the meal, we got our fortune cookies and we opened our fortune cookies and he opened his cookie and he looked at it and he looked up at me and he said dan this is for you and he gave it to me and it said you are kind and friendly and i still have it it's like a treasure Uh, but yeah he was he was the real deal well dan well while we were watching the movie i kept turning to ronnie and saying i think this is what happened to dan but so i came away with with the belief that he this is what happened to every journalist who went to see him Mm-hmm. But I didn't know that it actually was some of it was based because it was so similar to what you had always been telling us about your visit. Yeah, the thing about that, uh, the thing about that, uh, to be honest with you, is unless Fred was, he did very little press, very little press. So Tom, so Esquire landing that was actually kind of a coup for them. Oh my God, look at that. That's the spread. Where did you find that? I haven't seen that in years. Found it online. That's actually, that's the spread from the magazine. Um, wow. Cool. Yeah. Good job, Lane. Yeah. And he, uh, he took a picture of me too. And my contributor photo for that issue of Esquire was the shot Fred did of me. And it, I loved it because it said, you know, photographed by Fred Rogers. <laughs> <laughs> but that scene is in the movie too. That scene's in the movie too, Dan. But yeah. I haven't seen the film. I well, seen he the takes f- the reporter's picture. Oh yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, Tom. You like to take pictures of the people that came to see him. Yeah, he did. He was amazing. He was amazing. Well, and you know, there's that whole, there's that whole like, oh, he's this kind of weird, you know, there's going to be detractors no matter what anyone does. But in my opinion, Fred probably made one of the largest contributions to humanity during his lifetime. You know, I mean, just the work he did with children alone, I mean, making them feel like, you know, regardless of how broken their environment was, that it was okay and mm-hmm. they're loved and could be loved and worthy of love. So, yeah. Yeah, amazing. we don't, at this point, with those children as adults, we don't know what portion of that personality was molded by him. It's, you know, it's, it's what's amazing about Fred, though, this is really interesting. You know, kids don't get stuff that's dated. They don't understand that. They just look at the content. Fred Rogers is still inspiring kids to this day. Mm-hmm. I mean, my friend Casey in New York emailed me the other day and said, it's all day long. We have Fred Rogers on for, for his son. Because, you know, the, the, that kid is not saying like, oh, my God, this was made in the 80s. This is crappy video. This is, you know, <coughs> That, that they don't see that, you know, so that that'll be relevant work for a, a long time to come, I hope. Yeah. Well, Dan is a man of many deep interests. When he gets into something, he takes a dive. His passions range from aerospace to insect life. The additional fun being that Dan has the joy of capturing new and unique perspectives of the subjects which most intrigue him. Dan, uh, do you find that you that you make a photograph to help inform others or that the photographs you make allow you a perspective that better informs you? I think it's a little of both. I mean, I feel like there's a great photographer, Jay Maisel, uh, from New York, and he was an inspiration for me when I was growing up. And uh, he said, if you want to be a better photographer, become a more interesting person. And I actually, because as photographers, we're completely dependent on content on material on a physical object a physical individual whatever to create our to create our work uh it's important for us i think to have a vast understanding of you know where we live what we're surrounded by what how we communicate how we inspire 
Um, and some of the, you know, some of the great, you know, working for National Geographic is amazing because, you know, I can work for such a long time on a project and generate so much work and get so many edges, you know, you showed that glove uh, earlier that I think was from the, uh, that's uh, Armstrong's uh, pressure glove. Uh, yeah, exactly. From wow. the, that's from, uh, that's his, uh, that's the pressure glove from his suit, which went under the EVA glove uh, when he walked on the moon. And then that suit right next to it is his flown A7L Apollo suit. Um, so that's still, if you look down by the knees and the feet, it's still got moon dust all over it, um, which is pretty interesting 50 years, you know, after the fact. And but, Dan, you fully, you fully geek out in the presence of all this stuff, correct? Oh yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. Sometimes probably more so than I should, but, um, <laughs> but you know, the truth of the matter is once again, it's not like a ploy to get any more access or anything. It's like a genuine love of, you know, a, a friend of mine's a digital artist at industrial light and magic. And he said, if I'm going to do a, let's, for example, let's say he's going to do the smoke coming out of the smoke trap smokestack of a train in digital, right? He says, before I do anything, I have to become an expert in what that looks like. I can't just work out of my head. You know, I have to like research this and look at it and analyze how it hangs, how the smoke dissipates, like all of those things. And I think in photography, it's the same. You know, I mean, I have to understand, I understand that suit. I understand how it was used, how it works. You know, the companies that made that suit, you know, Playtex, who made girdles and bras and, underwear made that suit you know like just all of those sort of aspects all of you know kind of around and then to be honest there are certain things i'm really passionate about really familiar about and it's generally it's generally known in the photo community so if they need people need pictures pictures at prisons for example like i get a lot of calls for that because they know i know how to navigate that world i know how to get in i know how to deal with it i know the, i know the drill you know they're all the same time wise setup wise going through the gear all that stuff uh, aerospace stuff same thing you know aircraft space program launches all those things any insect stuff any biology stuff and then of course you know i do a lot of portrait work as well well now you have such a big name in the industry the, the jobs come to you, I'm sure. But uh, uh, when you're beginning, how did you gain access to some of these things you, you took photographs of? And so that's a really good question. Um, so I started as a uh, photojournalist for a newspaper in Ventura County. And uh, I moved to New York uh, okay. because I knew that publishing was there. So I knew that publishing was in New York. And if I wanted to work for magazines, which I did, that was where I had to go. Um, I grew up on geographic and life. So I had a deep love of like the magazine form, you know, the big picture stories, you know, full page images and stuff. You know, for me growing up in Ventura County, rural Ventura County, this was like my window to the world, right? Seeing these photographs and not only wanting to be at the places, but actually being the guy that made the picture, being the guy that saw. Oh, interesting, it. interesting. Yeah, that was like, I really wanted to be that guy. You know, I, I love being the viewer, but if I could be there, I would mm -hmm. love that. You know, and I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've pinched myself in my career with regards to, you know, p people I'm with at any given time. I usually stop before shoots like giving an example of the obama one where i'll i'll get my crew together in a circle and and just you know kind of acknowledge like the moment we're in right now and let's try to take this in this is going to go very fast and let's all try to be present enough to like absorb something from the experience you know oh well, nice it sets a little the walk. you know yeah it's a pep talk. And also and i also i do it for myself because you know sure. you know i don't i don't want the president to just be a surface that reflects light you know, I like the idea that there's a humanity there as well. Oh, nice. Well put. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about street photography? Because I, I'm a great admirer of that. And I, I just wanted to hear some of your thoughts on capturing people that don't realize they're being captured and whether or not that's okay. Because mm -hmm. one time I was, there was an extremely old woman. She maybe, she looked like she was a hundred and she was getting her hair done in the window of a restaurant or a restaurant that would have been weird and yeah check please. Please. Right. check please check a lot of us we haven't been out in a long time louise you're forgiven yeah. well yeah. maybe there'll be like one one location where you can just get everything done but anyway she's she was getting her hair done in, in and they Georgia. Had it right it's in the in window 
And Dan, I, I couldn't resist. I, I, I started taking pictures and the woman cutting her hair went like this. And I'm, I'm thinking one day the world will be happy that there's like a 107 year old woman getting her hair done yeah. and yeah. I've captured an image of it. So mm -hmm. I just want to hear your thoughts on, on this. Cause I always, I have Ron stand in front of me, you know? I, yeah. I, I do just, that too. Yeah. It's tough. Yeah. I don't have Ron stand in front of me. <laughs> yeah, Ron stand in front of you. Your beard's in the way. The, uh, Jamie's got some nice shots of Ron. I do. standing in front of me. Yeah, same, right? <laughs> the thing about it, I mean, you could look at it multiple ways, right? You could look at it as like etiquette uh, and you could look at it legally, right? So legally, if you're in a public space on public property and you're using a focal length lens that doesn't exceed a normal focal length, so like a 50 millimeter lens on a 35 millimeter camera, um, you can shoot anything you want. Uh -huh. uh, now, you get in a gray area when you shoot on the street for any kind of commercial purposes or advertising because there are facades that are copyrighted, like the Radio City Music Hall is copyrighted, the Guggenheim Museum is, uh, the Disney Concert Hall is copyrighted. So if you're doing an ad for Toyota and you park a car in front of the Disney Concert Hall, uh, I can't remember what the fee is, but it's like insane. It's like 30 something yeah and radio city is the same way but typically you know you could you can photograph anything so you know i've i've there have been times in my career where i've been sort of assaulted not physically but verbally for shooting in a public space like a park or whatever mm -hmm. and you know i can either try to diffuse the situation by explaining what I'm doing and that I'm a photographer and I'm trying to create a document of the city and I've been working on this for years, which very quickly like dissipates the situation. Or I could say like, you know what, legally I'm, you know, you have you don't, I'm legally, uh, I'm fine to shoot here. I don't usually go that route. I have before when people persist, you know, you can't shoot me. You can't shoot a picture of me. You can't shoot a picture of my, like, uh, you know, just let's drop it. You know, but is, is the legality of it defined by how big the lens is on, cause you mentioned the 50 millimeter lens. What if you got a 200 or a 400 on there? You can't shoot onto private property with anything longer than a 50 legally. It's, all, it's, it's yeah. also yeah. defined. It's also defined by the size of the guy talking to you. Big time. Yeah, totally. Uh, you walk, uh, if you walked around in a neighborhood with a 200 and you pointed your lens at their window and people are in there like having dinner or whatever, that's a problem. You know, yeah. the 50, yeah. if it's visible, you know, it's visible from a public vantage point. I can sorry, I can take a picture of you, your house, your car, anything. Was um, this law augmented at all by Jackie O and her experiences? Like at what point did we come upon this law? Oh, I have no idea. I don't know. I, I mean, interesting. I, d I do think that it's interesting that historically, when we were talking earlier about the picture magazines, um, the picture magazines owned the photographer's archives. They were shooting for Life Magazine, and Life Magazine owned their images. So all of that work, you know, from the 30s, starting with like Margaret Burke White in, you know, the first issue of Life, all the way up through the 60s when Walker Evans was still shooting for them, um, all of that film is owned by Time Life. They weren't the photographers. There was work for hire, uh, which sucks because they didn't have access to their archive. Mm -hmm. um, ever since I've been shooting, uh, I do very little work for hire. The work for hire stuff I usually do is uh, really big high-end mm -hmm. advertising stuff for Apple. Um, Apple's one of them, but there are a number, um, you know, Netflix, Apple, Sony, like Sony Animation, Sony, you could think of a bunch of different ones where, you know, basically they leave with a hard drive and they can do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. and, and usually the one stipulation we make in our contracts is you can do whatever you want with this, these images provided it pertains to this specific subject we're working on now. Like you can't like recycle this thing 10 years from now for something else because I'm sure that that happens. I shot one time at a studio in New York and uh, it was a rental studio. I don't even remember what I was shooting years ago. But the I walked in to the studio, and there was a huge poster of that really famous Maxell uh, ad of the guy sitting in the chair. Oh, yeah, Maxell <laughs> and the speaker. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, oh, oh, great shot. So they got great shot, right? So the guy who owns the studio had shot that photo. And I was like, oh, my God, that's so cool. What an iconic image. My God, that, that thing must have generated so much in usage. He said, I got paid $500 for that. Done. It was a work for hire. 
he shot his, he did his day for 500 bucks in the seventies and that image is still used. So crazy. I don't know. That's and he had, he, he had to spend the money on new speakers too. No kidding. Yeah. It's a blow, yeah exactly. so. I, I, I still want to hear a couple of stories about when you were starting off and you weren't. Oh, right. I got, I got a well-known photographer. Yeah. And you had to steal stuff uh, or you had to, you know, walk in with a clipboard and pretend like you belong someplace. Oh, yeah, totally. Well, the, the truth is, so yeah, I got sidetracked. Um, but going into the uh, magazine, so I knew the magazines were primarily in New York. And I knew that's where I had to be. I didn't know anyone there. Uh, I figured it out. I went there by myself. I had no friends. I, I got hired by a very successful commercial photographer at the time, Chris Callis to uh, be his assistant. So I worked for him for a year. In that time, I was building my portfolio up so that when I left him after a year, I was, magazines have a very sort of structured way of reviewing work. They have drop off days to where you drop your portfolio, let's say on a Thursday, and you pick it up Friday afternoon after four. And the photo editors would look through the drop off portfolios. And your goal, honestly, at that time, my goal was always like, if you got a note, there was a glimmer of hope that you would get an assignment. If someone took the time to, you know, say thanks for dropping this off or whatever, because oftentimes there was nothing. So it was kind of known in the sort of starting off photographer world that like right away the question was, did you get a note? So, which I loved. And I always got notes and I kept all of them. I have a huge thing of notes, which I, which I love. So what I didn't do is I didn't do sort of like a carpet bombing technique where I just like saturated the magazines. I went to the newsstands. I looked at magazines and I said, you know what? I could live in this magazine. I could be in this magazine. They'd use the kind of work I want to produce in this. Yeah. Magazine. And so I surgically, you know, Rolling Stone. I mean, I, 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 I never forget uh, Metropolis was a magazine uh, in New York, an architectural magazine that was really beautiful, big, large format magazine. They did really beautiful stuff. And I dropped off at Metropolis and I went and had uh, to this Cuban diner I loved. Then I rode my bike home and I had a message on my machine in that short period of time, about an hour and a half, where I got two assignments. And that was the first, wow. that was the first drop off I ever did. And I was just like, oh, God, this is so easy. Of course, it's not. <laughs> I found that out later. But I, I, I remember that brief moment of like, oh, I'm, I've got it made, you know. Um, but, you know, uh, you start shooting. And, and I tell students this all the time. Uh, you know, you're, it's literally like it's a, you know, it's an old quip from the record industry. But the idea of you're only as good as your last record, you know. And, and I tell students, it's like, you know, you're working for someone who has a boss, who has a boss, who has a boss. Mm -hmm. And if you don't deliver, you're not going to get another assignment. You've got to every single time swing for the fence, you know, and uh, that's like no pressure, advice. no pressure, but that's the best advice I can give. And I still have to do that. I still do that. I still follow that rule. It's just like, it's got to be the best thing I can do right now. I don't and hear clicking, Dan. I don't hear clicking. Uh, oh, yeah, I don't hear clicking. Dan yeah. is also a talented builder and <laughs> will often construct a set for a particular subject. Uh, can you talk about how you um, how you go about doing this? Let's let's see some of that some of those images where the sets look so unique because Dan has physically constructed them. Mm -hmm. I don't know which ones you have. Um, some of them are much more complex, of course. But uh, yeah, these are uh, these are all stuff I built. Yeah, I built this this thing. Um, that's at my studio in Austin, the, uh, the grocery store. That was about a GMO thing and how GMOs are so prevalent. And uh, this Dan keeps a 50s family in his studio. Yeah, I keep these, these people. I shot it both ways. I shot it with and without the black. You know, the idea is that we're unaware of these GMOs, right? We're unaware that they exist. Oh, really? Yeah. So the idea is like... <clears throat> marked really well but the housewife that's trying to get that i love this model by the way nikki o'brien's her name she was miss teen texas and she has like the biggest smile she's a phenomenal model um but yeah the the the, the sets are you know out of kind of necessity and also i think to a large degree a lot of this illustration work especially is so stylized um you know the place doesn't really exist if you go to actors if you go to actors and uh, look at Helen Mirren, um, it should be uh, actors. Yeah, it should be pretty close to the front. Not sure where. Oh, I, the reason I wanted to call that one out is because uh, 
is because for a couple of reasons. One, it was a very expensive set to build, but it was also uh, it was also one of those things where I sold it to the magazine by saying, this is a magical place and it doesn't exist in Los Angeles. The only way we can see this thing is if we build it. And they said, okay, and they afforded mm. for it. It was for the New York Times. So you uh, had it in your mind, what you wanted. Yeah, well, I wanted, um, maybe go to, uh, go to uh, over, Overview. Might be in there. Well, okay, here's a good one. Uh, see the one of Ryan Gosling right there? Yeah, I built that. So that was uh, that was a photograph uh, that was pegged to Blade Runner twenty forty nine, oh. and um, and you know I certainly didn't want to do Blade Runner twenty forty nine, and I didn't really want to do uh, the original Blade Runner uh, anything, but I wanted to kind of call out the idea of that sort of like cyberpunk slash diesel punk kind of aesthetic. And uh, so we built this set that my description to the magazine was, I want to build this set that feels like a really overlooked and dingy old science museum in Prague. <laughs> and they were like, why in Prague? Anyway, I don't know. But so the, the kind of the concept behind it was that um, I could kind of have free reign that way. You know, we weren't trying to copy any Blade Runner thing, but it still had a flavor of what those two films kind of embody. And so I built that device that Ryan's looking through um, at my studio in Austin and then shipped it to LA for the shoot. And then that the building or the structure in the background and all that, that was all built on set. Were you, uh, hey, hey Dan, Dan, have you always kept uh, consciously or unconsciously a, uh, like a visual encyclopedia in your head when you see things, do images stay there that you can later call upon or reference and use? Big yeah, big time. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. And I email myself a lot. I draw little sketches and photograph them and on my phone. So I have them, I have sketchbooks. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I, I'm sure I've lost more than I've kept just <laughs> like, you know, you get a great idea and you're like, Oh yeah, I'll remember that tomorrow. And then it's gone. And then a couple of weeks later, you remember it. And it's just like, but it's, it, you know, yeah. And the other thing too, is like the idea that, you know, all the work I've ever created is like an amalgamation of all the experiences that I've had and everything I've encountered. So it's like what we're doing essentially as artists, there's the Helen Mirren picture. I'll talk about that in a second, but what we're doing as artists is we're, we're really kind of like kind of regurgitating in a unique way because it's run through our filter of our experience, kind of a life lived, which I've always thought was kind of an interesting thing. Um, that Helen Mirren picture that you just set up was, uh, so that's, that's one of the ones where I said to the, that was New York Times Magazine, I said, I want to do a picture that looks like she's gliding across the floor in this like atelier in Paris. And this doesn't exist in LA and it certainly doesn't exist next Friday in LA uh, at two o'clock in the afternoon, you know what I mean, in, in Culver City. So uh, we built that and uh, I'm really proud of that image, by the way. I just felt like we nailed it. And, and a lot of people, when I tell them it's a set, are surprised by that. And I, I think that's a success. I think that's successful that, uh, that um, you know, we create kind of a world that some of these people inhabit. And sometimes, once again, like way more complex than other times but uh but I, I do like the idea of creating these spaces and these little worlds and then you know she walked up and saw this and said oh my god i'm really going to have to rise to the occasion to do this justice which i thought was such a wonderful compliment from, from helen mirren but you know i think when someone makes a great effort to uh ensure that the physical representation that i'm going to make of them has had some thought put into it and some effort. I think that's a flatter, flattering thing. You know? Sure is. Now, Dan, how are you using your uh, downtime? Is anything productive happening uh, for you in this quiet? Um, yeah, I'm working on a film, um, and uh, it's really it's it's really been uh, all consuming. It's a sci-fi movie, and it's uh, it's kind of in an unnamed future, and it takes place on Mars and on Earth in a society where most people of working class have had their voices taken away from them. So they use these devices that they can speak with. And it sounds like a very like crackly record and there's a lot of miniatures in it. So there's a lot of models. So I've built, I think 15 
14 or 15 miniatures for it. Uh, the biggest one's about five and a half feet long, uh, spacecraft that comes back from Mars and sleep pods and all kinds of stuff and wardrobe and all the props, everything. So it's been keeping me busy for, I've been shooting for over a year on that. Oh, that's awesome. I can't wait to see. Now, yeah. Danny, you, you have some questions for Dan. I like Dan. Danny's great. questions. Take us back to Dan's, some of the stuff that I know Dan loves to talk about. Unfortunately, you've got my questions there. Okay. And I, 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 wait, asked, I, oh, I, th I think I wrote a couple of them. Down. Do you remember your first camera? Um, yeah, I do. Actually. It was a uh, eight millimeter Kodak movie camera and my grandfather gave it to me and I still have it. And my first professional camera was a uh, 1972 Canon F1, which was a pro camera series that Canon made. They were brass, beautiful cameras, um, incredible kind of incredible tools all those old mechanical cameras are so wonderful they're just so intricate and if you're you know they look simple uh with the skin on but if you've ever seen one taken apart to where the skin's removed and you see all the incredible complexity inside of those cameras they're just total works of art they're like watches you know they're just how, how old were you when you started shooting uh nine is the first time i worked in the dark room when I was nine years old. And then to varying degrees of interest, in high school I was shooting a lot, a lot more film in high school than stills. And then at the end of high school, a lot more stills and then it just stills took over. And then I was shooting film as well, kind of concurrently, or motion, motion film uh, at the same time, sort of concurrently doing commercials and video, music videos and commercials and stuff like that. Well, did you get the opportunity at nine years old to get into a dark room? So I was a member of the 4-H Club of America. 4-H uh, Club was, uh, is, uh, is and still is uh, a division of the Department of Agriculture. Sure. And it was started in 1911. And the idea was that it was targeted at your rural youth to teach them trades. And I lived in outside Moore Park in Ventura County. And, uh, you know, we had pigs and cows and sheep and I raised bees. I still raise bees. Um, and, uh, apartment complex. I'm sorry. You lived in an apartment complex there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> apartment complex. It was kind of tight. Um, the, uh, the, um, photography instructor for 4-H, we had a photography, uh, uh, class was, um, named Clarence Dalrymple and he was a, former Navy combat photographer and he taught the photography class and he had a dark room in his house and his, friend, his son Kenny was a really good friend of mine and so that's how I got in I'll never forget wow. it's, it's so funny every time I go in my dark room which I have a dark room here I was actually just in it like two hours ago um, every time I go in a dark room I smell that glacial acidic acid and yeah. it takes me back to that minute that I walked into the players. Yeah. I think, I think anybody that's ever been in a dark room knows right? that smell. And no, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah. And they started actually making, this is actually kind of funny. They started making odorless stop bath and I used it once. And for some reason I stopped using it. The, the <laughs> magic. Yeah. The magic wasn't there. I needed that smell. I needed the fumes. Didn't know I was in the dark room. Yeah, exactly. I needed those. I needed fumes. The fumes. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great story that's a great story Danny I wanted you to tell uh, Dan what oh, you the grand the, yeah, the grandfather with your grandparents because maybe uh, was just a, you a, might know the answer yeah I just uh, it, it was just a, a memory from childhood I started shooting when I was seven years old and of course the whole thing back then was you know, you did. You developed the thing. You took it to the drugstore, and then you waited two weeks, and there was that buzz of going to the drugstore and opening the envelope and oh, the excitement. But uh, I, you know, I shot a lot with family, and my grandparents uh, lived with us up at our summer cottage during the summers. And whenever I would shoot my grandfather, we, had, my dad had a movie camera as well. Whenever I took still pictures of him, they always blurred. He always moved. And when I shot movies of him, when I shot eight millimeter movies. He would stand rigid still. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I just wondered if you had ever had experiences like that. And like I said to Louise, that wasn't really a question. It's just like I just wanted you to know that. Right. <laughs> what was your, what kind of camera was you? Do you remember? I, do, I don't remember that very first camera that my aunt gave me. It was, mm -hmm. it, it, I, it used, I think, like VP 127 film, black and white. Yeah. yeah. And, and 
uh, but yeah, I started shooting when I was seven and every, my dad shot too. So everybody in our family did Mixing. photography and, and he was always giving us tips and lessons. He was pretty good. Yeah. And we all got, we, all of us got pretty good. And uh, two of my, another brother and myself both ended up using dark rooms and doing it at college. And I actually thought that was, that was one of my career possibilities and I just drifted a different way. But when I look at your stuff, I go, boy, they're there, but for the grace of God. And, yeah. You know, yeah. And just, yeah, I just love it. I, I, I will look, I, here's a good question for you too. I love looking at photography. I will look at anybody's pictures in their home, their albums. They'll be busy at dinner. I find an album. I will start, I get lost in mm -hmm. photo albums. Do you love photography that much? My, my collection of, <laughs> it's, it's, it's on a mental level, but I've collected negatives since I was 14, other people's negatives. And I have <laughs> thousands. I have probably between 10 and 15,000 negatives of other people's work, glass plates from the 1800s. Oh, that's like, awesome. Yeah, like unbelievable collector of that and of just actually one of prints, huge collection, love. I love photographs. I love the form of photography. I mean, my whole house with the exception of, I guess there's several paintings and a couple sculptures is all photographs. Not my, so, uh, none of mine. Yeah, they're what? all stuff from the collection. One of the ideas I sent to Louise is a thought that with digital photography now, where people just, everything's on their phone, everything's digital, onto their upload cloud, blah, blah, blah. There's a whole generation that doesn't know about sifting through a shoebox and looking at prints. Is that nostalgia that's gone? Like, is that, are we the last people that will ever do that? Yeah, I, I've spoken about that before and written about it. I, I feel like what's happening now is we're creating the largest archive ever of imagery and it's probably going to be the most fleeting because people aren't going to be maintaining these archives. I mean, the archive I have, uh, the digital archive I have is a full-time job to, to, to maintain and to update and to update with newer operating systems and newer drives and we're transferring from drive to drive to drive to keep up with things and backups and all of that. And I feel like those, I feel like, you know, a lot of stuff is on people's computers and a lot of stuff lives in the virtual world. And yeah, it does worry me. It also, it also, I think the tactile experience of actually looking at a print and, you know, if you'll recall the prints you're talking about from the 127 cameras, they were um, three and a half by three and a half square. Yep. And they had the date. It said like July 69 or whatever. And uh, it, it was a forced intimacy, you know, you didn't hold that at arm's length, you brought that in close to you, you know, and there was a beauty to the idea that that print was in close proximity to the negative, which was actually in the camera. And so there was a physical connection to that to from the device, and which was in the camera, and then being operated by that individual. So there was an actual physical connection. You know, if I take a old negative of mine, I'm taking a negative that someone loaded into a film holder, exposed, printed. So there's I'm physically in the same proximity. And when I think about cards and the way we shoot on cards and the stuff lives virtually, it could live in ostensibly like a billion places on the planet. You know, that stuff. It's interesting you brought that up too, because I have such a fondness for sort of the esoteric and also fondness for the tactile that if it's a significant shoot and I want to really remember it, like for example, the Obama shoot, we pulled all the cards and they're in a little box and they're all marked Obama shoot the original cards that were in the camera that were at the shoot. So I have that physical connection. You know, it's not like we wipe the cards and they just right. went back into the rotation. They then become the neg the equivalent of the negative. Mm. The archives. Do yeah. you ever take photos with your phone, Dan? All the time. Yeah, it's a great tool. I love it. Yeah, it's really great. I actually just had GQ Germany just published an iPhone photo that I did. Really? Which, well, yeah, because it's, I really like the picture and, Kath said, oh, GQ Germany wants something about, I, um, you know, uh, about um, quarantining and isolating. And, and I had shot this photograph of a path I was on. This is really beautiful image. And I said, well, I like this. And this is totally relevant to what's going on right now. You know, it's an outdoor wooded path. So I sent the, I had Kath send the photo. It was really good. I mean, the iPhone 11 is a pretty amazing tool. You know, it's yeah. like incredible. And uh and then they were like, oh, this is beautiful. You know, we're going <laughs> to, it's the first iPhone photo I've ever had published. But yeah, I shoot with a lot and I, I have to be mindful. You know, I always have, um, I always have one camera with me. It's usually the same one these days. And um, 
I'm mindful of that. I'm mindful that if I start shooting something with my iPhone, I quickly take inventory and ask myself, is this something you want? Is right. this something you really want? Mm. Because, you know, when I'm shooting with my other cameras, I can make a 40 by 60 inch print if I want to, you know, they'll yeah. hold up. An iPhone image won't hold up. You know, that's the, I suppose that's, I don't want to say the downsize, downside of it, but, um, but uh, you know, iPhones probably like a 16 by 20 is the biggest you'd ever want to make one. Um, you could probably go bigger if you up res, but it's not going to, come anywhere close to like something with a really nice big sensor. You know, the I, the sensor on that iPhone is about a third the size of your pinky fingernail. It's okay. so small. It's a tiny little thing, you know, and uh, it's, you know, they, you know, they talk about it's 12.5 megapixels, but really megapixels don't really matter. It's sensor size. You know, that's how you get the dynamic oh. of the sensor. You know, it's not the megapixel count. What's um, the camera that you like to have with you all the right. time? Just going to ask well, yeah, the one I carry all the time is a Fuji X100. Uh, I guess the newest incarnation of it is the X100T. And uh, it's just a little, it looks like an old Leica, 35 millimeter Leica. It's a really tiny little camera. And I have a couple like accessories on it to make it a little more manageable for my hands. My hands are pretty big and it's pretty small. So I have like a hand grip on it and a thumb grip and stuff like that. But it's incredible. I've made really beautiful, beautiful prints with it. And um, and it's it's just a real gem, you know. And that's my walk around camera, like carrying, walk around carrying camera. Just it's always in my bag, always in my bag. Yeah. yeah. Dina, you've got some questions for Dan. So, Dan, I was interested in your experience at film school. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you went to Munich mm -hmm. to study documentary film, and I was reading that you were studying underneath some pretty amazing uh, luminaries. Mm -hmm. um, but then eventually you kind of went more in the direction of still photography, and I kind of want to talk about the similar. Like, I see a lot of similarities between photography, photojournalism, obviously, and documentary film. Um, and I just kind of wanted to know, like, what was the deciding factor? To be perfectly honest, I think the deciding factor was uh, earning a living. Um, <laughs> you know, I had always been doing stills. I got into the school by submitting a big still portfolio of photojournalism work. And when I got back to Los Angeles or the Ventura County, I really, after Munich, I had like expended all my resources and I needed work. And I took my photojournalism. It was, it's, it's such kismet. It's not even funny. It's just like, you know, this job opened up at the Thousand Oaks News Chronicle, uh, which was a 35,000 daily. We had six or seven staffers, staff photographers and a photo editor and a lab tech. And right when I got back from Munich, my photo instructor from California, from Moorpark College, John Gray, he called me and he's like, oh, they have an opening at the News Chronicle. You should go apply. And 87 people applied. And I was just like, what am I even doing here? Why am I even doing this? You know, and I got the job. So it's like one of those things where that kind of really cemented my focus on stills and kind of moved me in that direction. And um, I also honestly liked how immediate it was. I loved, you know, making short films while it's incredibly enjoyable, and I think the, the camaraderie of being on a set and working on a film production is really amazing. It's like the circus, you know? Um, but the, I kind of like the, I kind of like when I would do stills, I would, I was kind of working really autonomously, you know, it was like me versus the subject and I didn't have a crew and I didn't have, which now I work always with assistants, but I still do stuff by myself. But um, the idea of, the idea of um, it kind of being my thing and there was, it was all me. And when I started working for the Chronicle, when it was like three assignments a day, you come in, you pick up your assignment slips, you kind of prioritize them, figure out where you're going to do what, when, um, and really go out there and have to compulse. It's compulsory every single time you go out. I mean, that story I told earlier about you're only as good as your last picture. I mean, I started, that started when I was working for the newspaper 
paper. You know, you'd go out and you were expected to deliver and you were, there was no sort of excuse making, you know, it's like a friend of mine said one time, it's either photo credit or photo blame. (laughs) And, uh, and the, uh, and I think that's what it was. And, and Munich was phenomenal. And you're right. There were some incredible people there that were, they, they, most of them, I think, uh, Fassbender or, or I know Herzog was from Munich and he was in more of a, uh, sort of an adjunct kind of like capacity, you know, he taught like grad, the equivalent of like grad classes and stuff. Um, and it was an incredible experience. And I made a lot of great, oh, great. I made a lot of pictures that I love when I was in Munich and I had that immersive experience and I traveled around Europe and all those things were kind of wonderful. And that place in time, you know, early twenties, um, it was kind of magical. Uh, I feel like it gave me a really good sense of, because I traveled a lot, not only in Germany, but in Europe, in Western Europe, it gave me a really good sense of kind of this unified idea of humanity, uh, where growing up in isolated Ventura County was very sort of like, it was a little myopic, you know? Um, and so I really feel like, and now, I mean, I've been on every continent, but except for Antarctica now, and been in incredible situations with incredible people. And I really feel like a citizen of the world, you know, and I mean, mm-hmm. I talk to my parents about that kind of thing and they don't have any understanding of how that, how that even works. You know, how do you even do that? You know, how do you go to Kazakhstan? How would I even go about that? Well, I can tell you because I know how to do that. I do that stuff all the time. You know, it's kind cool. of, but, um, you know, still, you know, the portrait work notwithstanding, you know, I still do a fair amount of stuff that's like documentary stuff, photojournalism stuff, like the geographic stuff is always in that vein, you know, much, much more autonomous, you know, not really lighting very much, sometimes lighting, sometimes not. But, um, but that was a good question. I hope that answered it. Who is that? Oh, hi, Liz. Hi. Hello. Elizabeth is here with us because she's going to, she, she's got a closing song that she's going to play as we, as we end the show. But first, Dan, I wanted you to talk about the um, GoFundMe page that you guys are going to be launching very soon. Yeah, there's a, uh, you know, this, what's happening right now with regards to the pandemic has been, and, and I don't know when we're going to fully see uh, the ramifications of it, but it's affecting a lot of folks all over the world and it's affecting people financially. And an initiative was started by a commercial photographer in San Diego. I think San Diego, Tim Tatter is his name. And the, the initiative is to provide bridge money. It's a GoFundMe campaign to provide bridge money for photo assistants because they're independent contractors, very hand to mouth. And we rely so heavily on them and they have no way to work right now at all. And I don't either, but I'm okay. And they're struggling. So the idea behind the GoFundMe is a hundred photographers, a hundred prints, a hundred dollars. It's a million dollars in bridge funding for photo assistants. So uh, each photographer's choosing their own image and putting their GoFundMe uh, page up independently, but it's a part of a movement. And so we're going to launch our GoFundMe page on Friday and I'm going to do a hundred of this image, which let's see if I can, there we go. Yeah. This, uh, yeah. This is a portrait of a American bald Eagle. And I chose this image because I feel like the Eagle kind of, uh, em- is emblematic of strength, survival, perseverance. And, uh, you know, it's been co-opted by a lot of countries over the years. And But I really look at it as being this this idea of this kind of beacon of hope and this a beacon of strength. And so uh, we're going to do 100 prints of that, 11 by 14 prints, and sell them for 100 bucks. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, it's going to go live on Friday morning. And that eagle gave you just nine minutes to get that shot, correct? <laughs> That's actually the eagle that, like, messed up Trump's hair. I don't know if you saw oh, that. Oh, he's heroic. Oh, that's it. Good. Yeah. Same, did, same did, the, the did, the, did the eagle have little carpet patches in front of the nest? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, my God. The eagle was little square. Her things are I don't hear clicking. I don't hear clicking. Ah! Ah! <laughs> yeah, that eagle was – those things are scary, man. They're big. Yeah. They I mean, okay, have, wait. For – Back up a second. How did you get that eagle to to be motionless for the moment it, that, that took you to capture that image? And where were you two together? So we shot this in Corpus Christi. 
Okay. The guy that owns the Eagle is the only individual in the U.S. that is allowed to legally own live birds of prey outside of a sort of like zoo situation or a rescue situation. So he has all these birds of prey. So if you need an eagle, you go to this guy. And um, it was for the New York Times Magazine. It was for the cover of the January 1st issue. And um, the idea was, uh, you know, what's the state of America? I think that's what they kind of, yeah. That's how they ran it. That is magnificent. So we shot that. So that's a painted background that I painted years ago. Mm -hmm. I used that one a lot. That was actually the same one I used on Obama in that green, uh, that kind of green one. And uh, that perch uh, was just a log that was attached to a uh, two by four stand. And it was very difficult to get it. It was very, very difficult. He does not want to hold still, moving constantly. And it's lit with electronic flash. So, you know, the shutter speed is like, you know, two thousandth of a second. So, I mean, you can count every single little, like, piece of texture on the uh, feathers, which is also another way another reason that it looks so frozen but we did work for quite a long time to get that i think it wow. i think we probably shot for yeah, beautiful shot for a couple hours probably at least a couple hours of shooting time mm-hmm. uh, after you know doing the prep time ah, that is sensational. But yeah i would i would be really grateful because i know my guys are you know i'm not an, i'm not able to have them work right now and and, you know, I have two full-time guys that are, they're not employees, but they're guys that I've supported for years full-time. Okay, uh, so if we want to purchase one of those images, we go to your Instagram, your Instagram account, uh, which is? The Instagram ahead. account is just Dan Winter's photo, but the Instagram account will just, it's just going to be an announcement. Okay, and where to go. It'll, it'll tell you where to go. And it'll be $100 per print. Yeah, 100 bucks per 11 by 14 print, which mm-hmm. I think it's uh, a way to democratize art. Yeah, the Absolutely. Bernie print. In yeah. kind of a good way for people. All right, well, I'm going to read our closing credits, and then um, I'm going to ask uh, Elizabeth to share the song that t- she has for us. Then we're going to close out on her song. So let me first read the closing yeah. credits. I want to thank our guests, Dan Winters and Catherine Winters, for facilitating this conversation. Our panel is Danny Mann and Jamie Alcroft. Our producer is Dina Friedman. Our tech team is Thomas Hubble, Lane McFadden, Michael Tellup, and Francesco DeManda. Our sound mixer is John Maddox. Our webmaster is Bill Filippiak. Thank you for uh, sharing your song with us, Elizabeth Wolf. I am Louise Palenker, and this is Things I Found Online. We will see you next week. Be safe, be well, be kind. Elizabeth, tell us about your song. Great, I'll be quick. First of all, I want to say, Dan, I'm a big fan of your photography. It's a real pleasure to get to share the Zoom call with you. (laughs) Um, But this is a song called The Magic Toilet Paper Song that I wrote because I need a positive message. (laughs) in today's crazy uncertain times and it received a lot of really positive feedback um, online which made me uh, compelled to attach it to a good cause. I figured if people are sharing the video they might as well share a link to a donate button and I have fortunately linked up with Children's Hospital Los Angeles which saved my life when I was 18 years old and created a fund uh, to support kids during this time and it's actually going to be ongoing from now on but uh, it's kind of linking art and good things, just like yes. we're talking. And you have a true gift for melody. I'm in love with your music. So let's go ahead and, and play the song, fellas. And thank you, Dan, and thank you, everyone. Bye bye.
sky.